is Jason Farmer. I'm the president of the, uh, of the uh, parent organization, the CPO here at Crestview. Uh, welcome. So this is the first uh, general, C general meeting of the CPO of the year, uh, which we actually do quarterly. And we pair the CPO meeting with the principal's coffee. Uh, so what we'll do for today is uh, I'm going to let Dr. Jansen do his, uh, his update. We've got some speakers from, uh, from Crestview and from the district that have a great topic uh, that they're going to cover. And then we have some brief meeting uh, uh, business, CPO business, that we're going to take care of after that. I'll hand out the agenda. Um, it's going to be a very brief meeting afterwards. We actually don't have a lot of business in between our normal executive board meetings, so it will probably only take a few minutes, but I'll hand this out. If nothing else, um, the, uh, the contact information for all of the officers, uh, all of the names are on here. So if you have any questions or feedback or business that you want to bring forward, you can contact any of them or me. Um, with that, I'm going to hand a few of these out and uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Jansen. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, just FYI, we are recording this because I had a whole bunch of people say they can't make it during the school day. So we wanted them to be able to have the same access to content and um, be able to still engage with us that way. So most of your faces shouldn't be on there <laughs> if you're worried about that. So, um, well, there's Jason's agenda. This was going to share that out. Uh, so many of you know uh, this is the district strategic plan all the way forward. And there are seven district goals related to that. But for the schools, we just focus on the first three. And I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of what Crestview is doing in relationship with those three goals. So the first one related to student academic learning is we're creating assistance for students' goal setting, self-assessment, and reflection in all their coursework. So with each of the curriculum, there is a list of I can statements. Um, which kind of puts it in a student-friendly language so that they know what they're supposed to learn as part of this unit. So we're asking the teachers to help the kids look at those I can statements and develop some goals as they go through each of those in their coursework. So that's the first one. The second one, universal access, opportunity, and equity is to develop a multi-tiered system of support um, so that basically it's so kids get whatever needs that they have. Um, with 1,200 kids here, we can't really create 1,200 individual plans, but if we can set up a system that's gonna take care of 90% of them, then we need to have a system, you know, that's, we have to have additional support to help kids with the other 10%, whether that's pushing kids further at the top or helping to pull the ones that need extra support. And that's academically, behaviorally, um, socially, uh, whatever that might be. So that's our goal is to kind of develop a much better system for us to make sure kids are getting the needs, their needs met. And our last one is to make sure that we provide a warm, welcoming, and safe school environment. Um, the safe being multifaceted, one just physical safety. We just continue to review the building, make sure that there's, um, you know, we, we, we are well protected for our kids here um, from outside things, but even just monitoring just to make sure that there's actually safe sidewalks and things like that as they move through the campus. Mm -hmm. um, but also the welcoming part is, is a bigger piece. So uh, our CPO has set aside some money to, um, for the teachers to add things to the classroom to make it more warm and welcoming. Um, we've used that as a focus as we started our school year. And we're just trying to do some additional things around school to make sure that every kid feels included and welcome to Crestview. So just an example, if you look at the sign for start with hello on the way out right by the guidance office, you see it's in multiple languages. So we're just trying to you know, make sure that every student feels included at school. So that's what Crestview is doing as we move towards um, meeting those, the district goals. So I want to give you a little COVID update. Uh, as you can see our current week, you know, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, We've, it really hasn't been bad. We've had six cases since the start of the school year, and that's caused us to quarantine 14 kids besides those six. So it really hasn't been, um, really hasn't been that bad. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. You know, we, we can get into the debate about the mask, but that's the 
the guidelines we have to follow. But because of that, we're able to keep all the kids in school. Because if they're unmasked, we'd be sending a lot more students home. And we're finding that several of our kids have been vaccinated, so some of those kids have been able to stay at school too. Um, you know, just looking at that, you know, if that trend continues, that would be great. Last year, post Halloween was kind of our apocalypse time. So we're kind of like, if we can get through this next month, that might be a, a good hurdle for us. So I just wanted to kind of give you an idea. You can see all these things on the district website if you're ever curious. Um, but I really don't like sending you the, the emails. It's a, there's a, you know, a close thing. But just so you know, if, if your kid is one that would have to be quarantined, we would send you that. If they are deemed to be close but both students are masked, you're just getting an email from me. So that means they weren't six feet apart, but they were somewhere between three and six feet apart. So for the middle school, it really doesn't make a big deal, but if that happens to a high school kid, then they don't, they're modified quarantine and they can't do like their, um, they can't participate in sports during that window. But for us, you know, we're not, we're not limiting them from participating in interscholastic sports. All right, um, Dr. Willott shared at our last uh, board meeting about the curriculum advisory committee. Um, so it used to only have 10 people on it district wide and they're expanding it to I think the number is 47. Um, somebody wants to do the math, they can, but if each elementary has one seat, each middle school has two and the high schools have four. Um, I have a couple volunteers, but if anybody is interested in being part of that, you would just be looking at district curriculum on these couple meeting dates, December 1 and April 20th, and there's two different times of the day. So if that's something that fits in your schedule and something you're interested in, you can just shoot me an email when this is over and we'll work through it if we have more than our two volunteers. All right? Um, let's see. That was the gist of what I had. There's uh, a couple other things. We're, we're working on transitioning from leader and me. Uh, we've created our own leaders acronym, which you may see around school. I was going to bring one in here and I forgot to do it. Um, but we're also going to work on recognizing our kids for meeting those expectations. So you may hear some um, some buzz coming out about us recognizing kids for doing that. We're going to do a student of the month. Um, one thing I may ask with that, we're going to get the yard signs to put up for it's the student of the month and then ask that those signs come back after it's no longer their month. But if you're somebody that's a stay at home and wouldn't mind dropping a yard sign in, in, in somebody's yard once a month, I'm looking for some volunteers. You can, you can send me a message about that too. And I don't know if you follow Nish niche, however you want to say it, dot com rating schools. Now we are number three in the state of Missouri for Crest Two is the, the, the third best middle school in the state of Missouri. So that is pretty awesome. I just saw that yesterday. Um, so do you guys have a couple quick questions that you may want to ask of me before I punt it to our um, guidance support? Yes, ma'am. I have a question about textbooks. What uh, happened to regular textbooks? I have two students, one is a sophomore, one is a sixth grader, and they both wish they could use regular textbooks to study instead of having to navigate multiple web pages. It takes away their actual study time. And also, um, different areas, IT, technical issues, computers may slow down, break down, various Wi-Fi problems, may lead to annoyance, frustration, and also anger sometimes. What is the reason behind it that we diverted away from using the textbooks? And also, is there a chance that we can kind of get back to uh, giving them this opportunity again? So, uh, the short answer I will tell you on the on the textbook difference is the cost. Um, just because the purchasing one um, is is it's way more expensive to have a hard copy of a book. So that's why there's been this gradual change. Um, with the, with that, that's that's one reason. Um, now, we if your child wants one, and we have them, like we're happy to share them. Like if you're a sixth grader, I think the only actual textbook that we have for them is the world history. Um, we have one, so if they want to have one checked out to them, we certainly can do that. So she can apply for that. Yeah, she just needs to ask the teacher to be able to get one. And if that doesn't work, just uh, email the uh, counselor, and we'll get it. Give them any of the any of the ones that we have. We're happy to let them take our hard copy. As far as math, 
Um, or algebra textbook? It's not um, well, the, it, it kind of depends on which class they're in. If they're in an algebra, they should have a, it's like a disposable textbook. It's a, it's a consumable, is what I meant to say, where they write in there, and that's, that's the extent of it for, for the algebra class. So obviously, it sounds like the priorities as far as funding, the priorities have changed, and somehow the textbooks have become on the bottom of the priorities and gone to the bottom of the priority list. Well, maybe I'm just I don't know the exact answer, I but I will get one for you on where those where that change has happened because that's that's my, not a, a decision I'm making at the building. Like we, if we're given the, the textbooks, we make them available for the kids to use. So, all right. So if there's some others, I'll happy to talk to you when we're done and give you a little more too. So. I don't want to keep these two any longer, so um, I'll introduce our two speakers for today, and they're going to talk about adolescence and mental health. So without further ado, we have Ms. Allison Carroll. She is our eighth grade guidance counselor this year, and I'm assuming we'll be looping back with our we take sixth graders next year if you have a fifth grader, and then Ms. Holtz is our social worker, so please welcome them. You guys can use this like oh, okay. you would like. So, hi everybody, thank you for having us. Um, Dr. Ganson just uh, introduced us. I'm Erin Post, this is Allison Carroll. And um, we are just gonna talk a little bit about adolescents, mental health, and kind of maybe some different things that are happening now since COVID-19 has become a thing. So, um, we hear the word anxiety, I think a lot of times it gets kind of overused. Um, and, and so these, this is just some different takes on the definition of anxiety, um, because we do all experience some anxiety, you know, day to day stress um, is different than anxiety. Um, APA defines it as an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, physical changes, like increased blood, blood, blood pressure, um, or persistent feeling of apprehension or dread. Um, but I really liked this, this one, I just went to a training last week um, presented by Annie Mouse, and she's a staff member at West County Psych Psychological Associates. But she kind of, I think, I think she came up with this this sort of anxiety formula. If we look at it as like an overestimation of threat plus an underestimation of the ability to cope, that results in anxiety. So when we're working with kids, we kind of take like, you know one or both of those and, and try to get the student to reframe it um, in their mind and, and either you know talk down this estimation of threat or try to increase their capacity to cope and help them you know just feel more confident in their coping skills that we can get through this, you can do it, um, you know here are some tools you can utilize um, and that will of course impact the way they're perceiving that anxiety. And, you know, and to the point of, we all experience anxiety at times, like it's a human emotion, like it happens to all of us, but um, when it becomes maybe overwhelming or too much, it could be categorized as an anxiety disorder. So that's, um, you know, the <coughs> DSM-5 is what clinicians use to diagnose mental health disorders. So um, there's a whole umbrella of anxiety disorders. Um, generalized anxiety disorder is one of them. And um, these are kind of the different signs and symptoms. The main one, you have to have this excessive anxiety worry. Like that has to be present. And then these other ones, I think it's like four or five are, are necessary to be diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. Um, with this, the worry has to be disproportionate to what triggered it. So. Um, you know, it's it's kind of like, oh, again, overestimating that threat. So um, it has to be that, and it also has to be for about six months or more, almost on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's not just like you have a really bad week. It's like at least six months of this kind of chronic anxiety or these different symptoms. Um, and it's also hard to control. You know, it's not just like, okay, I, I can talk myself down, I can use my coping skills, and I'm going to be okay. It's just, it impairs your day-to-day -day life. And then these are just some of the other anxiety disorders that are categorized. Um, phobias or those irrational fears. A lot of times we hear, you know, phobias, like you might be really scared of spiders and to the point where it maybe affects your day-to-day -day life. Um, so that's an example of a phobia. Social phobia is fear of social situations. Um, also can be called social anxiety. 
Um, and that's one that really with COVID-19 might have gotten exacerbated a little bit more for people that might experience that because we didn't have to go out when we were all in quarantine. So now that life is becoming a bit more back to what it was before, getting back out in those social situations might be harder for someone that experiences that. Or it might have just exacerbated it for someone who maybe wasn't showing those signs before, but now it's become more of a concern. Um, and then panic disorder, recurrent panic attacks, and separation anxiety. Um, I know we think about that a lot with younger kids, but sometimes we do see that in adolescents and older children as well, too. So fear of separating from your, your caregiver or losing your attachment figure. So um, Ms. Hodes talked about that generalized anxiety disorder um, and some of the, the things you might see with this, but um, this is just, these are some things like at home when you're, when you're just observing your own children, um, you may see some of these things. Um, and, and again, a lot of this off and on is normal for teens. It's just that when it's persistent and, um, and kind of unmanageable, then it may be time for an intervention. So you may see, you know, excessive fears or worries, kind of, again, back to that anxiety formula, the overestimation of threat, like, you know, you and I might say, this is, that's not, not something to ruin your day over, um, but it's, it, in their mind, it is excessive. Um, inner restlessness, hypervigilance, I mean, you can read down the list, but um, if you notice that, like, a, these, these um, symptoms increasing and increasing over a period of time, um, with your child, you know, you could, we'll, we'll get to the resources at the end of the presentation, but, um, you know, that's when it becomes more of a concern. So, yeah. It's something, I, the irritability piece, like again, teenagers can be, can be irritable, but um, that is something that can be a symptom of anxiety and depression too, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. So I, um, and then, uh, yeah, and under that, the inability to focus, you know, sometimes parents or children or teachers might think it's an attention issue when really it's anxiety and it man manifests very similarly. So um, if it is, you know, if it is anxiety, they may not have, have the focus um, to, to really concentrate on math when they're playing through these irrational fears or worries. Um, so anyway, that's just another, another piece we see a lot. Yeah. Okay, and depression, um, again, these are kind of the, the diagnostic criteria from that DSM. Um, there's sort of two different kinds. There's what they call major depressive disorder, which is kind of, I think, traditionally what we think of with depression, that it's sort of, um, it's an episode. So it kind of might last for three, four, or five months, kind of like peaks and flows. Um, there's also something called pervasive dep depressive disorder, and that's kind of a more low level, like chronic type depression. So. Um, Again, these symptoms, these are the symptoms of really both of those. The core two, or these top two, you have to have one of those to be diagnosed with depression. Um, and then after that, it just, it's, you have to have like five of them total. So weight loss, changes in sleep, being restless, or just feeling like slowed down, um, that fatigue, loss of energy, um, feelings of worthlessness, that's a, another big hallmark of depression. Um, and again, going back to the focus and ability to concentrate, and then suicidal ideation as well, too. And um, here's just some other things you may observe in your own children. Um, again, day to day, most of these things are, are normal for teenagers to experience somewhat, um, other than, you know, well, really the top, the top ones, other than self-harm, you know, if it's just off and on, it's probably something that you know you can manage at home. Um, but if this is something, if these are, are sign, these signs are, are recognized in your child for um, every day for at least two weeks or more, then again, it may be some time to intervene or seek resources or help. And definitely with that bottom one, if they're using self-harm as a coping strategy um, in dealing with their depression, there's resources out there to help too. So, um, as far as COVID-19, um, there has been some research done as far as like how it might have impacted children's mental health. I mean, there's not a ton out there because I mean, we're still in the midst of all this. But the CDC has done some work um, and those top two bullets I mentioned are studies that they did. 
Um, initially, last fall, they noticed that there was just a rise in mental health concern, like visits to the emergency department. That's what ED means. So an increase in those emergency department visits um, by 30% from spring 2019 to 2020. So uh, there could be lots of factors at play there. I mean, in spring of 2020, a lot of things were closed down, so the emergency department might have been the only place for people to go. But um, it's just, it is a, a statistic that they have noticed. Um, and then more recently, they have continued to track some of the data and noticed that between spring of 2019 and spring of 2021, that some of those emergency department visits, um, especially for suicide attempts for girls in that 12 to 17 category, there was about 50% more from 2019 to 2021 for girls age 12 to 17. So um, we don't have the cause and effect for that, but it is just a trending of this. And then there's been some, um, some countries that during when we were all really quarantined and locked down did some just online surveys with teens and just asking for symptoms of depression and anxiety and they did notice an increase in some of those symptoms. So um, in a lot of countries, um, I think it's like China, Bangladesh, some of those kind of countries that, that they had done this review of, but um, they did notice an increase in some of those types of symptoms. And then um, I read a research review that basically kind of told us the obvious that we all know um, working with kids and having teenagers is that when we were socially isolated, it was really hard for our kids. And so um, some of the things that they picked up was that there was just increased uh, report of feelings of loneliness, isolation, those kind of things, which makes a whole lot of sense that a lot of us are feeling that way. But for kids, especially, especially teens who are so dependent on peers and identify so much with their peers and developmentally, that's where they're at, is that that's how they're kind of figuring out who they are is by interacting with their peers. So they really did feel that. So there's a little bit of research on that. Um, the next point about stress. So when we experience stress, which we all experienced a lot of, and we've probably still been experiencing a lot of the last 18 months, um, our body releases cortisol, which is a hormone that um, really helps regulate that stress response. So in particular, when we have that fight or flight response, cortisol is being activated. So it affects lots of different systems in our body, but it also does, including our, some of our neurotransmitters like serotonin, which then impacts mood. So depression, um, you know, what they found is that there's lower levels of serotonin in people who have depression. So if cortisol is impacting those neurotransmitters, certainly all of our kind of increased stress levels may have also impacted our mental health. So that's just kind of something else to think about. Um, and also our parenting, I mean, what we're experiencing the stress, but that does kind of trickle down to our kids. And so we may have all not necessarily had the same routines or done the same kind of things, or maybe even it's been emotionally available for our kids just because we were going through it too, and so that's I know a struggle I've had with my young kids at home. And it can certainly impact kids and just sort of what, what we're experiencing right now. So um, if, you, if you're feeling like some of the signs and symptoms that we talked about um, are, they sound familiar with what you're going through with your child, a good place to start is the pediatrician. You know, you can call call our office too, but we, a lot of times we'll say it is good to just seek out um, or share your concerns with the, with the doctor. Um, sometimes they'll take a look at the child's overall physical health, make sure that they are, you know, getting adequate nutrition, adequate sleep, as we know that that can um, make, you know, our emotional health and our mental health worse if we're not taking care of our physical health. So, um, you know, they may ask for tests to be run or blood tests or um, they may offer, you know, parenting advice or support, um, things you could tweak in your day-to-day -day routine, your diet, your um, medications. So pediatricians have a lot of resources and ideas as to how to, um, how to treat anxiety or depression in teens. Um, but it's it, they also have a good list of referrals and outside um, professionals that they they can um, you know direct you to. Um, and yeah, I think just that's kind of a good place to start. If you're in the midst of a crisis where it, you know there's safety concerns or or you need immediate help, two really good um, resources is this behavioral health response. The numbers there, or the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, I believe. Yeah, both of those are 24 hour, so anytime, day or night, they'll provide you assistance. And then, of course, you have the you know emergency department, or you can always call 911, and they could direct you to 
um, appropriate responsive services or um, you know local hospital and get you connected with some ideas to yeah. next and that's behavioral health response just so that's a local um, it's a local organization they have different <coughs> different hubs throughout like the state, but they also provide, so it's a, it's a 24 hour crisis line, but they will provide out, they have outreach workers that will come out to you as well too. Um, so I will often give that number to kids that I see too, just to say, hey, you know, if you feel like this is not a 911 situation, but if you've got something going on and you feel like you really need someone to come out and help you and talk to you through the situation, they can come out and then do an assessment as well too, and then they might recommend hospitalization or, or those kind of things, or they might also then get you in next day with a provider. They actually have some connections with some mental health agencies in our area where they can get kids in like next day or next couple of days, which sometimes is a little faster than what we can we can recommend or for some of the places that we offer too. So, um, and if you're a pediatrician, you know everybody's pediatrician works a little differently, but um, we're always happy to like like Allison said, provide some resources. And a lot of doctors' offices have their own assessment tool, yeah. and they will they'll uh, you know utilize that if you're saying you think your child's depressed or anxious, they can give them kind of a screener to to assess whether this falls in the normal range, or if it is a concern, um, and if you know they're feeling thoughts of suicide or anything like that, they can also assess for that as well at a doctor's office. So, all right. And then just, I mean, things you can do at home as well, too. Some of these, a lot of these are things that we, strategies that we do with kids here at school, too. Um, breathing exercises are always a big thing. I, I, mean, I think for any kid that I come across, I always will talk to them about doing some deep breathing. Um, there's lots of different ways to do it. There's square breathing where you take some breaths in, hold it, take some breaths out, hold it. Um, same thing with like a triangle. There's lots of different ways, um, and you can Google that and look that up, too. Um, we're happy to give you some of those kind of resources as well. But um, another one that I really like is this five, four, three, two, one, and they call it it's a grounding exercise. So it's using your five senses. And this can be really helpful with kids, especially if kids are a little more elevated or stressed or worked up, where um, if you kind of identify different things in your surroundings using your senses, it can help. So five, I always do five things you can see. And I, a lot of times, will identify a color. Five blue things. Look around the room, five, five things that are blue. Um, four things you can hear. So really kind of pay attention to what's going on in the room. Maybe you hear the AC coming up. Maybe you hear someone outside the door walking in the hallway. You know, things that you wouldn't maybe normally pay attention to. Try to identify four things. Um, three things you can feel. So that might be like, okay, I feel my body sitting in this chair. I feel this smooth armrest. I feel the way my pants feel on my legs. Just anything like that. Um, two things you can smell, and then one, I always just say what, like, think about what you taste in your mouth. Like, if you taste your, your breakfast from this morning, you can just get a drink of water, does it not taste like anything? Just kind of thinking about that. Um, those are just a couple of examples of things we use. Um, and then positive self-talk is always a big thing, too. A lot of times kids who might be experiencing mental health issues or just even in, in like, a, having a stressful day, we kind of go to more of a negative self-talk in our heads, so trying to just repeat some of those things and always pairing it with a deep breath too is what I do. Like take a deep breath and tell yourself it's gonna be okay. What do I have right in front of me? Like I can do this. So sometimes just some of that positive self-talk can really help too. Um, and then self-monitoring, rating things on a scale of one to 10. Um, I put the thermometer image on there too, just if you guys have younger children, sometimes that really helps them to have a visual and like, okay, where am I at a thermometer? What's, what temperature am I at? Um, but it, help, it can help for other older kids too as well. Sometimes just having a visual is good. And then just kind of those morning and evening routines, just having some consistency, um, especially for kids that maybe have a little bit of anxiety. Laying your clothes out the night before, taking a shower the night before, those kind of things so everything's kind of ready to go. So we kind of just know what's going to happen. And I mean, sometimes routines are hard. I mean, especially the evenings, like if your kids are involved in activities or have things going on and trying to get homework done, like it can be sort of hard to keep a very like, specific routine. But just kind of having a general idea of, okay, I come home, I eat a quick snack, I start my homework. Or um, maybe you take a 30 minute break to go play outside, then you come in and do your homework. And then we have dinner and then you can watch your TV or whatever the case may be. Just trying to kind of keep some of those routines. Back to the self-monitoring, I just thought of something that has worked well with some of the kids I've, I deal with that um, have 
that have very, very hard days and, and um, ongoing levels of depression. Um, it just like a white, gray, or black day. So a white day would be like, it's been a great day. I felt positive all day, you know, good, like maybe there were some challenges, but I was able to overcome it. A gray day could be, you know, I had some ups and some downs. And a black day or a dark day could be like, I, I really need some help. Because sometimes kids have a hard time saying that. And also it's kind of a hard thing to like, initiate a conversation with parents and vice versa. So anyway, I just thought that's, that's something that um, I feel like has worked well with some families. It's just like, you know, what kind of a day was it? And then it's a one word response and you as a parent kind of know, okay, what do they need from me tonight, you know? So I know how much, sometimes kids, you know, I know it's hard to get things out of them after school too, right? It's like, well, which, how was it? I don't know, I don't know, I'm not gonna talk about it. But yeah, but even just like you said, those simple three, white, mm -hmm. black, or gray, if they even one to 10 is like too much of a scale. Yeah. And the idea behind some of this is that, you know, kids that are struggling, I mean, especially, I mean, depression or anxiety or anything really, um, it's, we want to try to keep them to their expectations, but also help give them the coping skills so they know how to handle it. Cause that's such a big thing with anxiety when they have that, they just don't feel like they can do it. So it's like, okay, no, we can, we can do it. We're going to do this small piece and this is how you can I'm gonna help you get through it. So that's really what we try to promote with kids, but I mean, these are things that anybody can do at home as well, too. And then, you know, just a couple other ideas, just like healthy habits and routines, as I said, you know, physical health impacts our mental and emotional health, so make health, so making sure we're getting adequate sleep. Sleep is so huge. I feel like most of the time when a kid comes into the office in tears, like, you know, find out they didn't sleep last night, or it, it seems like that's that's a very common, um, you know, trigger or, or pattern um, when, you know, the anxiety is super high or, or the depressive symptoms are super high. Um, diet, you know, have you had anything to eat today? A lot of times they skip breakfast or they didn't eat dinner and they didn't eat breakfast. So just sometimes like, you know, diet, um, but getting exercise and getting outside and getting sunlight, that can have a huge impact on kids' mood, and that's something that's, like, free and easy and just, like, let's go for a walk and get out in the sun and um, move our bodies. That can definitely help. And then mindfulness, um, like, Ms. Hotes shared some strategies that are, that are just effective in, like, getting kids over some like day-to-day -day struggles, the, you know, calm or, you know, breathing techniques that she shared. Um, but coloring works really well for some kids, journaling, listening to music, exercising. Um, there's some like apps that um, kids have had good luck with. with um, there's one called Stop, Breathe, Think, and that's free. And it has like guided meditations for all sorts of things. Guided meditations for anxiety, got it? Guided meditations for sleep. Um, to, you know, just kind of targeted. And some of them are two minutes, some of them are 10 minutes. Um, if you go to YouTube and look up Stop, Breathe, Think, they have like, you know, cool colors and music and a very calm voice so the kid can watch it on their Chromebook if they wanted to. Um, and, and there's tons more than, you know, on, on YouTube and also like podcasts and um, iTunes and but I'm thinking the other apps, there's a Calm app that costs money, but it is really good. Headspace is another one, really good. So um, there's a bunch of them out worth there. Worth a I mean, try. The ones off the top of my head. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, and that's something that like, if if they're not responding to you, you could say, hey, try this, and it's you know it's something that they can plug into and try to redirect their thoughts and um, might be a good approach. And then this just kind of came across my email, and I thought I'd share it with you guys, is that um, Chaz Coalition is an organization here in St. Louis that does a whole lot of work around mental health, um, specifically adolescent depression and suicide. And so um, we use them here. We use them here for some of their pr programs, just prevention programs that they have. I will sometimes refer to them because they do. Um, they provide just individual counseling and, and mental health support. Um, but they're they're doing these podcast conversations. I don't know a ton about it, but um, they had, I guess it looks like to be the first Tuesday of every month. This is on their website as well too. 
but um, I guess it's, it's parents will be able to submit questions and just kind of have conversations around a lot of these kind of issues. So I thought that was a kind of a cool resource and something different that they're starting to do. So I figured I'd just pass that along to you guys while we were here. Um, and I think that might be going out in the email as well to Dr. Jansen's weekly email. So you can look for that there as well. And here are some more resources. Um, these first two are local um, and they will provide services. They'll, um, if you reach out, they are right here in the St. Louis area. Um, and then these last three are just really good places to reference if you have questions or want to learn more. Um, they're, they're just some good um, resources to reference. My daughter is Chad, and they do telecounseling too. So mm -hmm. she had the lady, she was having a very difficult time early on with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. They used it, and she spoke to her maybe once a week. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty helpful. Yeah, good. Yeah, and I know I think they are doing both telehealth and in person counseling right now. Their office is down in South County somewhere. Yes. But yeah, but I believe they're still doing both telehealth and yes. um, in person, so it's kind of whatever your preference yes. is. Some of the time and they got in contact about 2 30 every day, I mean, on Fridays, and it worked yeah. out well. Yeah. Good. There are places that offer like um, texting to support, which for some kids that's like way more in their comfort zone. And the HR actually has a text. Line, which I did not include that in there, but they, if, um, on their website, there is a text number that you can text as well, too. If for kids, it can be like a little more discreet if they're, you know, wanting, if they're worried about talking on the phone um, at home or whatever. Um, but I was also going to say, some, a lot of insurance um, have have offerings for telehealth, like Cigna, I know does, and I think that's becoming more and more common. Um, I think. I've heard, you know, like you said, it was very effective, um, but some, some kids this age, they, they don't want to talk to somebody through a screen. They want to go somewhere and meet someone, depends. so it just depends. But it is nice that, like, so there's so much more availability with, with um, the internet and Zoom and all that um, and telehealth um, over the phone. That those kind of resources didn't exist 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you tell the group a little bit more about the therapy dogs we have here at Crestview? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, they I don't both. Know if everybody knows that they're available if your kids having a bad day. Yeah. I mean, they have quite. been awesome, really. They've been great for um, all sorts of issues that kids are having, either even just like getting to school, if they know they can go pet the dog when they arrive. Um, or if they're you know, feeling anxious. We have one that stays in the library that belongs to Ms. Dumont. She could kind of tell you more about the training that's been through, but the, the dogs are amazing. They're like little robots almost. They're so well behaved. They're very well trained. Um, yeah. And yeah. Is he over here? <laughs> that's not good. No, Is it good? I want the dog. She, yeah. Yeah. He, I mean, both of them. They play, you can set them up. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're related. I think they're cousins or something. But then Miss Kaplan, our seventh, one of our seventh grade has the other one. So we kind of, it's nice because we kind of have one on each side of the building as well, too. Yeah. But it's like whenever one of them walks into the hall, oh, yeah. it just brings like a smile to everybody's face. And I just, I honestly, when when we got the first one, I was like, okay, not every kid's a dog person, but like, I haven't seen any kids that have had a bad reaction to, yeah. you know, and being if there's around. a situation that comes up. Yeah, you know, they just, are, they love, oh, love the dog. It's, it's a, such a bright, yes. yeah, it's such a bright spot. Oh my gosh, the teachers. Yeah, I was going to say, last year, I think it was better for the teachers than the kids. Yeah. <laughs> Did someone say, are they about kids being scared or allergic? Oh, just, I said, I feel like it's it's just gone so well for it, yeah. all kids. I haven't have heard of any like, big issues. Issue. Come up, Bridget, with like allergies or well, no, and no, 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 no. my son is severely allergic to dogs, like severely. And um, so we never had a dog before him, and he is totally <laughs> fine because he's hypoallergenic and he lives with us, obviously, and he's totally fine. And then um, we have right now, there's only one student who is doesn't like dogs at all. Like, some didn't like dogs at the beginning, and like now they're like his mm -hmm. favorite person in the whole, I mean, they adore him, but there's one, but when she comes in, he, if I put him in a stay, he'll just stay there and he won't move, and so I just put him in a stay behind the counter and he didn't come out. Mm -hmm. so, and, um, yeah, he just turned two on Monday, so he's still a puppy. Yeah. Yeah. 
Pardon me? You have one that goes to One that stays in a seventh grade classroom and then he goes to classrooms. Sometimes teachers will call and say, hey, and he goes less because we have so many that come here for him. Um, so he doesn't go as much to classrooms. Oh, that they didn't need him. So yeah, last year he went to classrooms a lot because yeah. the classes weren't in here as much. But he is, he's a sweet boy. Yeah, he's good. I mean, he'll get, he'll, the last, last year I let the kids like play with him more and run around and stuff because there weren't classes in here, but now I'm like, just pet him. And so he stays pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that he, I guess he's trained this way. He will go from person to person mm -hmm. to visit well, everybody. He, he wasn't, but he does. I feel yeah. like other dogs, as long as you would pet them, they'd stay there for half an hour if you didn't yes. them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He stays with you for a little bit, and then he's like, I'm going to go help the next person now. Yeah. And he just moves. And kids will instantly like, and again, it's, I'm so thankful to Dr. Jameson because I always tell people I didn't, I've never had a dog. I didn't particularly love dogs. I didn't care really one way or another. And we had Clayton and I watched the impact it had on the kids. So when that, when that teacher moved, um, I was like, I'm in like just the joy that it brings the kids and the teachers and, um, and me. <laughs> so now I'm like a crazy dog lady. <laughs> so. Yeah, and then he has like a little place we can put him up. But if I'm out of the library, I leave him. He doesn't do anything. I mean, he's he's a good he's a good boy. So, yeah. does anyone have questions? Thanks, Bridget. Thank you. She has. You know how like how frequently do you guys speak to the students? Um, I mean, it's like, do you go in and tell them like some of these feelings are okay, or you should reach out to a parent? Like, what's the in like the student? Well, one thing I think we do a good job of is just like being available to kids. We're in the hallways at every passing period. We're in the lunchroom every day. Um, we do guidance lessons periodically throughout the year. Um, last year we had to get creative and we did the Mindful Mondays and utilized Canvas to push out content. But um, I think it also helps that we live with kids. So we've got three years to develop that relationship. Um, and I think just like being accessible and available helps that so that when a kid's in crisis, they know like they've talked to me about all sorts of stuff before they, you know, before they really need me for, um, you know, to figure out this challenge that they're facing. Um, so, I mean, we do, we, we've utilized chads in the right. past. Um, and we've done some of those kind of people with you, like, um, um, I mean, not last year, but the year before, we developed like a couple lessons for mentor time that all the kids were seeing that um, one of them specifically was about stress versus anxiety. And if you're seeing these things, like maybe you should talk to an adult, like depending right. on what it was, and also went through some of these coping things. Yeah. So we have pushed some of those things out through mentor time in the past too. And then like Allison says, Chats has come and um, done their preventative exercise with kids where they really focus in a lot on like depression and symptoms of that and suicide and talking to a trusted adult. Yeah. So sometimes we use outside organizations Mm -hmm. uh, do you also get feedback from the teachers in the sense that hey you know the student is not yes, their yes. normal self today so maybe maybe you need to have yep. oh definitely okay. yeah usually usually if a concern comes across it's you know from a teacher or a parent will call or sometimes a classmate is concerned but we attend team meetings twice a week with the teams so you know we might meet with a blue and we'll talk about you know if there's any concerns with kids on that team. Or if I have talked to a parent about something going on at home and I have permission to share it with the team, that's a great time to do it. Um, it just in person in conversation, we can kind of brainstorm interventions or responses that the teachers should have when they're dealing with that kid in class. Um, so that that's a, an awesome time for us to just kind of collaborate and communicate. Because I mean, the teachers do see the kids way more than then, I mean, we see them in the hallways and at lunch, but they may notice things that come up in um, a writing piece or, you know, something that was a concern with, like, in a class discussion or something. So that those are, that communication is so important between us and the teachers and the parents, too, as well. You know, we get a lot and, and welcome any, any um, information that is relevant and important for us to know. Um, sometimes, it's just like, 
it's you know the parent will say I don't know if this will affect them but we have this going on at home and I just wanted you guys to know what was happening um, and that way we can just kind of keep an eye on the kids too We just, you know, put our contact information here on this last slide. We have a grade level counselor for all three grades, and then Ms. Hotz is a wonderful resource too, um, social worker. Um, so definitely feel free to reach out if, if anything comes up that we could help you with. Um, or and if we don't know or we don't feel like um, qualified to handle the situation, we have good, an awesome list of uh, places that we refer out to. So. Um, don't be a stranger if you're if you're having any concerns with your child. I think it's never it never hurts to you know just consult your your doctor, your school counselor, just reach out for for help. I don't think you can like overreact. <laughs> yeah, much. bottom line, you guys know your kids. I mean, if, if you feel like something's off, you know, reach out, give us a call, give the pediatrician a call, whatever. All right. Thank right. you, ladies. All Appreciate right. your time. Thank you. You're up, sir. Sure. So we've got about uh, seven minutes or so left in the hour that we reserved. So I'm just going to go through a few items that we have left uh, on our agenda. Most of the reports I actually have uh, to deliver myself today. We have Zoe, Stephanie and Lucy in the room from our board. Um, I have a few announcements to make just in each of these areas. Um, so in terms of the uh, president's report, I just have a couple, uh, a couple of announcements. The executive board meeting, which if you're not familiar with how our board operates, uh, we meet as a board monthly. Uh, it's the first Wednesday of the month, and that is where we do a majority of our planning work. Uh, is as an executive board. We do these meetings, like I mentioned, just quarterly. Um, and it is a great opportunity to be face-to-face -face with some parents to get feedback and questions. But most of our work is done uh, in the executive board meeting that's coming up on October the 6th. Um, also, the President's Forum, uh, if you haven't been a part of a, of a, uh, a board at a previous school, each president of a PTO or CPO in this case from every school in the Rockwood School District attends uh, a president's forum meeting where we hear from the and Zoe is a actually a former board member of the president's forum so she can probably speak to this more so than I can but it is a great opportunity for PTO leadership across the district to get together to hear from folks from the district also to share ideas and best practices uh, we will typically send at least a few people from our board to that meeting uh, each time that takes place. I try to make it myself. I, I do most of the time, but not always, and Zoe is a great fill-in for that. Um, that next meeting is coming up on October the 13th. Um, also in my area, we are preparing a parent survey. It's been many, many years, if actually never, since I've been in Crestview at least, that we've seen a parent survey come out. Uh, from the CPO. We are preparing one of those uh, to come out in the next few weeks or so. I'm, our board, and I'm particularly interested in getting feedback from parents on uh, how they view our board operating, uh, the events that we have going on, uh, how we're doing our fundraising. Uh, I, you know, we'll be looking for just some feedback from parents on how you think things are going and give you an opportunity to provide some suggestions as well. Um, if my board members that are here, if you do have some questions that you want to be included on that, I uh, still have some time to submit those to me. So Carrie Schuert is our VP of fundraising. Um, unable to be here today, we'll wish her well. I think she'll be fine, we'll just say. Uh, we'll send her a get well card. Uh, she uh, is in charge of our Partnering for Success campaign, uh, which has been running over the last few weeks as of a couple of days ago. <coughs> We were running at about 75% of our goal, um, so we've collected a little over $11,000. Uh, we did not run the campaign last year um, for COVID purposes. Prior to that, the uh, collection was around $20,000. So we had lowered our goal from, um, uh, or I should say, we set our goal at $50,000, so we're, we're not there yet, um, unfortunately. 
Not at 50. Not 50, 50. 15. 15. 15. 15, sorry. Yes. Did I, maybe I sounded like It 15. sounded like 50, that's wrong. 15, not yeah. 5. Uh, so we're, we're short of our goal, but we'll be wrapping up that campaign shortly. We try to have only the one fundraiser per year um, so that we're not doing cookies and pizzas and every fundraiser that you can imagine under the sun. So we do try to keep it only to this campaign, uh, which we will be trying to wrap up uh, shortly. Um, in terms of events, the only event that we have upcoming uh, is that we do have as part of our budget uh, in teacher appreciation to provide dinner for uh, all of our teachers who do conferences. Uh, that's coming up on the 28th and the 30th. So the CPO pays for dinner on one of those nights. It will be the 28th this year. Uh, Natalie Vaca is the board member who's responsible for this. And Natalie Hartwig and Whitney Hatfield are our parents who are doing uh, most of the organizing for that event. So they, uh, using our funds, are gonna be providing uh, Jimmy John's catered uh, along with uh, crushed red salad and some desserts. Uh, so that is well underway and we'll be working with, uh, with Natalie and Whitney to get all of that delivered uh, for our teachers on uh, the 28th. In regards to our budget report, I will say the update at this point is that it will need to be updated. Um, with our funding for uh, uh, partnering for success running below where it normally is, we will need to be taking a close look at what we have in the budget and look at our expenditures and how we're going to allocate those for the remainder of the year. Um, you know, the goal as a CPO is, as it is with most if not all PTOs is to spend in the calendar year or in the school year the money that we collect. So we intend to take anything that we collect from partnering for success and return that to the school community in the school year within which it is collected. So uh, in terms of the budget, we'll need to take a look at that and, and see uh, what change we may need to make as a result of our PFS fund. Yes, Evan? Can I just add, things have been a little wonky with the website being rebuilt as of now, but generally speaking, and we're working towards it, the budget and the minutes should be visible so that we're clearly transparent to everybody. So maybe not today, but hopefully in the near future, if you wanted to access the budget and see exactly how things break down for spending the funds, it should be available to everybody online. Yes, and that's a good point, and I was going to speak to that when we got uh, down a little bit more. Sorry. The No, no, that's fine. I, I, I appreciate that comment. Yeah, the, the website, uh, as with all of the district online resources, has to be reconstructed, mm -hmm. and much of what was recovered uh, for our website, uh, which happened uh, about three weeks ago, I believe, three, four weeks ago, uh, was a few years old, so um, we'll, I'll let Lucy touch on that a little bit, but um, in terms of the budget, the budget, the meeting minutes, all of those things um, will be refreshed online shortly, so thank you for that. In terms of uh, parent involvement, so this is volunteer recruitment and placement is sort of an ongoing exercise. Um, in the middle school environment, it is different. There aren't as many events. Uh, and a need, the need for volunteers, parent volunteers, is not as great at the middle school level as it is at the elementary level, which is where I came from. Uh, but uh, we do have opportunities for parents to get involved. You will see mentions in the uh, weekly updates from Dr. Jansen where we may need a volunteer here or there to help with a particular event. If you have signed up uh, previously, uh, you should have by now heard from either Dana uh, or Debbie, who just joined the board recently to fill an open spot, Dana Aldendorfer and Debbie Bellmer. Um, but that is an ongoing exercise. If any of you in the room are interested in participating as a volunteer, please um, stop by and talk to me afterwards. So we're moving quickly. We're going to go a couple minutes over. I apologize, but uh, Lucy is in the room. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you for a quick update. So just as uh, Jason mentioned, um, quick update. So um, I do the website updates and then also the uh, membership toolkit app, um, app, which is our student directory. So as far as the website, um, yes, you know, we all know that, you know, we had website problems over the summer. So we are 
rebuilding it, um, like Joey mentioned, um, the email, I mean, the emails, the minutes and the uh, budgets um, are getting put back out there, but it's a slow process because we have to try to gather all that information again. So uh, if you just keep checking back week after week, um, things are getting updated, um, surely, but slowly. On the um, student directory front, though, uh, membership toolkit, so that is back up and running again as well. Over COVID, I think a lot of people um, didn't really use it because we weren't really in school a lot last year. So a lot of people's, um, what you call verification, went into an outdated status. So if you have seen already in your inbox, if it's not in your inbox, it may be in your spam folder. It's also come out in the theories weekly email that um, you need to go in and re-verify your information. And this is where you also have the opportunity to select which information you would like to have shared in that directory. But in order to gain access for it, um, everyone's current memberships need to be uh, re-verified uh, again. So sixth graders are doing a great job because as they are new to the environment, they just go in and create a new account. But it's all the uh, existing seventh and eighth graders that we need to get in there and get those um, verified. So if you're talking amongst your friends, <laughs> please try to spread the word because we're trying to uh, get that built back up again as well. And um, I think that's it. Those are really the main two things that I have. Okay. Thank you. And then Stephanie Murphy. Um, just real quick, CPO is on social media. We have a Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram page. I'll leave this on the table if you haven't liked or followed us yet, and you can just snap a picture of it or um, follow us in one of those formats. Um, to date, we have 366 Facebook followers, 193 Twitter followers, and 21 Instagram followers. So. Spread the word. <laughs> it's hard to compete with Dr. Jansen for um, for for, uh, for reading time, <laughs> but uh, uh, there is good information that's posted out, out uh, in our various social media outlets. So before I close, Zoe, do you have anything that you want to add? I don't have anything specific on here for you, but I wanted to no, give you a chance. No, just um, minutes. Generally speaking, we try to be transparent with the minutes and with the budget. It just isn't their moment momentarily, but um, that's it. I just wanted everyone to know that it's accessible to you, and you also just contact any of us if you have any specific questions on it. Excellent, thank you. Well, to stay on time, I'm gonna go ahead and close out the meeting, but if any of you uh, parents would like to talk with me or another board member uh, after we're done, if you've got feedback or questions, ideas, um, preferably no comment or no complaints or anything <laughs> like that, preferably, but um, I'm going to be sticking around until everyone is gone, so you are welcome to um, to, get, to grab me after the meeting. But with that, um, Dr. Jansen, unless you have anything else, we're done. All good. All good. Thank you.